I now call to order the Society's 2,446th meeting in the 150th year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's lecture by Olivier Goyon. The Society has been meeting and hosting lectures via Zoom for over a year, starting with the Joseph Henry Lecture on May 15, 2020, almost a year and a half now. The first four meetings this fall also will be done via Zoom, at least partly due to COVID-related restrictions and partly due to speakers' travel limitations. We remain optimistic that the society will be able to meet again in person by the end of the year. Of course, we are at the mercy of the pandemic and the measures the authorities institute to deal with it. While we hope for the best, whether in person or not, the society will continue meeting and live streaming events, and it will be working assiduously to learn how to utilize the tools of video production and social media to bring science to everyone and enhance the value of membership in the society. Let's take a moment to thank the sponsors of the 2021-2022 lecture series for their support, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous donor who asks to remain anonymous. Thank you sponsors, one and all. I am pleased to announce the following new member, tonight's speaker, Olivia Goyan, whose interests will be clear to you in part from tonight's proceedings. We welcome Olivier to membership. If you're not a member and you would like to support the society, you can do so through the PSW website. We welcome new members. You can join by using the blue join button at the upper right-hand corner of the homepage. Recording Secretary James Healan will now read the minutes of the 2445th meeting and the lecture by John Moult on the first serious problem solved by AI, how proteins fold. James, screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Good evening, everyone. On September 24th, 2021, by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called the 2445th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, John Mould, professor at the University of Maryland's Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research. His lecture was titled, The First Serious Problem Solved by AI, How Proteins Fold to Become the Machines of Life. Moult began by relating his talk for the evening to the lecture he delivered to the Society in 1999, which was also about doing community science. He then addressed the provocative title of his talk, stating that protein folding is an incredibly important problem that humans cannot solve without artificial intelligence. Proteins are essential to most biological functions. The sequencing of a particular protein alone does not indicate the protein's function, but the sequencing of positively and negatively charged amino acids will cause the resulting protein to fold into a particular highly ordered shape. These shapes can be reduced to a two-dimensional image. There are approximately 1,000 common folds and a significant number of less common folds produced by unique amino acid combinations. The novel shapes of differently folded proteins create surfaces which can be complementary to the surfaces of other molecules. Molt said these combinations are key to the whole of biology and illustrated his point by explaining the work of Osnat Herzberg. Since the mid 20th century, scientists have known that if they could compute the various amino acid combinations, they could predict new proteins and their folded shapes. This problem has proven difficult because of the huge search space to find the right fold, a frustrated search landscape, and the finely balanced energy minimum of a given protein. Scientists have taken essentially four different approaches to the folding problem based on structure principles, search methods, 
physics, and evolutionary relationships. Most approaches have failed. So far, only deep learning has successfully and efficiently produced models to predict protein structures. Scientists began using computers to tackle the folding problem in the 1980s and 1990s. Those efforts produced significant optimism, but few results. Moltz said computer modeling lacked the rigor of the real world, could not be effectively peer reviewed, and thus could not solve the real world problem. To address that failing, Moltz and his colleagues, including Christoph Fidelis, introduced the Critical Assessment of Structure Prediction, or CASP. CASP is a roughly analogous to a clinical trial by going to experimentalists every two years to inquire about their then current non-public research. The structures those experimentalists are working on are then sent to other researchers in the community who are invited to produce computed models which are later compared to the experimental results. Around 100 groups of researchers participate. Moltz then discussed a sampling of CASP results. At times, CASP has shown progress in solving the folding problem and at others, progress has appeared to stall out. CASP-2 models in 1996 had only 8% contact precision compared to experimental results, quickly doubling in 1998 and reaching 20% in 2000. But that rate of improvement quickly tapered, reaching only 25% contact precision by the time of CASP-11. Most recently, contact precision has leapt, reaching 40 47% in CASP-12 and 70% in CASP-13. These dramatic improvements are credited to advancements in deep learning, by which model neural networks learn from two-dimensional images of protein structures to predict new protein folds. Early deep learning used neural networks to perform convolutional feature extraction to piece together a complete prediction network. These early efforts produced accuracy rates around 60%. But by 2020, deep learning improved accuracy to 85%, principally led by research groups AlphaFold and DeepMind. DeepMind's method starts by creating a contact map and then in the second stage of the network, inputs contact maps to output atomic coordinates. The method also uses attention learning by which part of the network interrogates the process to identify where there is greatest information flow to construct a set of weights for where to relate things. DeepMind also incorporates features of the physics approach to the problem to simplify the network structure. With these improved models, experimentalists have been able to quickly move through many impasses. Molt predicts the rapid developments will produce breakthroughs in rare disease research, such as sickle cell anemia, and contribute significantly to cancer research. Pharmaceutical research will also benefit by understanding how drugs bind to proteins. He then described how the deep learning models have been applied in SARS-2 research. These new models will also allow scientists to produce artificial proteins to pre produce better commercial products, like soaps. Moult concluded with his thoughts on how to judge how intelligent any particular machine really is. He asserted that intelligence can be measured by how well a machine can generalize and apply itself outside the data on which it was trained. The speaker then answered questions from the online viewing audience. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Mills signed adjourned the meeting at 10.16 p.m. The weather in Washington, D.C., 18 degrees Celsius. The weather, clear. And the number of concurrent viewers on the Zoom and YouTube live stream, 44. And views on the PSW Science YouTube and Vimeo channels, 353. Respectfully submitted, James Heelan, Recording Secretary. Thank you, James. The minutes will be posted to the website in due course. Uh, please send any corrections or comments on the minutes to corresponding secretary Robin Taylor at corresponding sec at pswscience.org. Before I uh, introduce our speaker, I'd just like to say hello to a few of our members who have logged into the Zoom call. So uh, welcome, Tim Thomas. Haven't seen you in a while. And uh, Rita Meloff, a new member. And also John Mather and Ron Eckers and James Fanson. Good to see you on the call. I hope you uh, find the lecture informative. And with that, let's turn to the lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Olivier Goyon. Olivier is professor in the Department of Astronomy and astronomer in the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. He also is affiliated professor with the Japanese Astrobiology Center and he serves as Extreme AO Project Scientist
for the Subaru Telescope and is a member of the Magellan Telescope Extreme AO development team. Olivier works on coronaography, wavefront sensing techniques for adaptive optics and astrometry. Currently, his work is focused on developing high contrast imaging techniques and technology, particularly for detecting and characterizing extrasolar planets. In previous work, he developed the phase-induced amplitude apodization coronagraph for masking light from a star while preserving light from planets around it. He is an author on over 169 refereed publications in science and hundreds of other publications as well. He's a MacArthur Fellow, recipient of a Presidential Early Career Award, and recipient of the Guignet Young Researcher Award of the French Society of Physics. He earned his undergraduate degree at the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Paris and his PhD in astronomy at the University of Paris. And it's all questions will be fielded after the lecture during the Q&A session. And it is my pleasure to introduce Olivier and turn the screen over to him. Olivier, the screen is yours. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Good evening. Uh, so it's my pleasure to tell you about adaptive optics and large telescope and, and, and what astronomers are doing and will be doing uh, with, with adaptive optics. So the title of this lecture is uh, Taking the Twinkle Out of the Stars. You, uh, you can see in the background a picture of the Subaru telescope, one of the current large telescope. It's on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, eight meter diameter. It's a typical of uh, large uh, ground-based telescopes. Um, and astronomers have long been uh, working very hard on uh, building larger and larger telescopes. Uh, so on the left here, you can see um, a representation of the primary mirror of uh, current, past, and future uh, telescopes, uh, both in space and on the ground. There are very good reasons why uh, astronomers want to build larger telescopes. Um, and by larger, uh, what, what we mean is the diameter of the primary mirror, the collecting element in, in, the, in the telescope. Uh, the most uh, fundamental ones are angular resolution and collecting area. So by, by building larger telescopes, we increase the amount of light that is collected. And that, that goes as the square of the diameter of the telescope. Um, and also, fundamentally, larger telescopes can access higher angular resolution. The angular resolution, the sharpness of the image, improves as the telescope gets larger, and it goes as one over the diameter of the telescope. So if the diameter is increased by a factor of two, the image size uh, gets uh, half as big, which is basically twice as sharp. Um, so I want to spend a minute or two talking about this very specific point, the angular resolution, the sharpness of the image, because that's the one that is linked with the topic of this presentation. Um, we can, in a computer, we can simulate um, what image we expect when we look at a distant star with a telescope. And for a circular aperture, it will look like this uh, diagram, where we can see um, that um, there is a central spot surrounded by diffraction rings. Uh, we call this the airy pattern. The size of this pattern is inverse linear uh, related to the diameter of the telescope. So essentially, if the telescope gets twice as large, this pattern will get uh, half the size, uh, which is good. So we conventionally describe the angular resolution of the telescope as, as an angle, which is, the, which is mathematically lambda over d, wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. And um, so we can actually look at what happens when uh, we um, uh, point a large telescope uh, uh, at, at stars from the ground. And unfortunately, we do not realize this gain in angular resolution. You can see the video on the right, which was taken on a 4.2 meter ground-based telescope. Um, the image of a star is not as expected from the previous slide. It is not a single diffraction pattern with, with nice rings and a central spot. This has been known for a fairly long time. Um, Newton in, in 1707 described it quite accurately, uh, especially for the time. 
so his quote is 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 uh, is on this slide. Uh, he, he he quoted that the star appears to be broader than it is, which is exactly what we see. Uh, and he suggested he even suggested a remedy. What what should we do about it? Uh, we should um, we should build telescopes uh, on top of the highest mountains ab above the grosser clouds. And that's exactly what ground-based astronomers are doing. Um, but today we can do even better, of course. We can, we can place telescopes completely outside of Earth's atmosphere in space. Um, and that's, that, that completely eliminates this, uh, this, this problem. So, Let's look at what we should expect with a perfect telescope and no, no atmospheric turbulence, no wave front error. So here I have a sequence of, of increasing telescope size from 0 0.1 meter, 10 centimeter at the top left, uh, all the way to 30 meter at the bottom right. And this is a simulation assuming no, uh, no aberration, no atmosphere. As the telescope size increases, the uh, spot gets smaller, it gets so small that when we get to 30 meter, the resolution of my screen is no longer sufficient to even show the spot, it becomes a single pixel. So we expect to get very sharp images from, from the larger telescope. What really happens though, uh, is this, uh, as the telescope size increases, the image of a distant star is no longer a nice diffraction pattern with the expected central spot and rings around it it becomes blurred. Uh, these are simulated short exposures. So they're essentially snapshot freezing this, the state of the atmosphere. And what we see is that beyond approximately 30 centimeter, there is no longer a gain in angular resolution. The image is no longer getting sharper. Uh, for reference, the size of each of these images is about two arc seconds on the sky. Um, and we can see that as we increase the, the, the telescope size, we get to essentially a steady state where the image size is approximately half an arcsagon to an arcsagon, depending on the quality of the site. And that transition happens already at 30 centimeter. So building telescopes larger than 30 centimeter is helpful because it, it increases the collecting area. We have more sensitivity, but we stop gaining in angular resolution. This uh, simulation is, is for optical light, visible light that we can see with, with our eye. Um, so that has been the, 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 the main motivation to launch telescope in space, especially the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, even though it is smaller than the larger telescopes on the ground, it delivers uh, extremely sharp images, such as uh, this one. This is called the Tadpole Galaxy. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, example of, of, uh, of interacting galaxies. Um, and, and this image is extremely sharp uh, all across the field. Uh, it is essentially diffraction limited, the size, the sharpness of the image is entirely driven by the diameter of the telescope, 2.4 meter in this case. And here is a comparison of, of, of the same field image from the ground uh, with eight meter telescope on the left and in space with a 2.4 meter telescope, Hubble Space Telescope. Um, the image, the ground-based image is quite sensitive. The telescope is large. Um, uh, it has a very good collecting area. Um, so uh, the faint galaxies are actually quite uh, well visible, and and they can be it can be even more sensitive than the space telescope. However, when we zoom in, we can see that the space telescope image is is about five to ten times sharper than than the best ground based telescope images, and that's before we do any adaptive optics. I'll talk a little bit more about what we can do about this. Um, I'll talk a lot more about this. But you can see in the in the bottom uh, two images, so bottom left ground-based uh, telescope image, uh, bottom right Hubble Space Telescope image of the same galaxy. There is a lot more information when we have sharper images. We can really understand uh, the structure of this galaxy, um, and 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 also uh, we can start to identify individual star-forming regions, clusters within the galaxy. Um, it's, it's extremely valuable and rich in information. And th that is the motivation for, uh, one of the motivation for launching telescopes in space. The other motivation, uh, which I'm not going to cover uh, during this lecture, is access to wavelengths that are not accessible from the ground. And this would be one of the very, uh, uh, one of the, actually it is the main focus, the, the reason uh, for the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, which will be launched shortly to exist, is, is access to infrared light 
which is uh, either blocked uh, by your atmosphere or for which uh, from the ground the sensitivity is very poor due to, due to thermal emission. So the solution to this problem, uh, the solution that Newton did not envision but, but came much later, uh, is adaptive optics. Uh, this, this, the concept of adaptive optics was first formulated uh, in the middle of the last century. Technology at the time was not uh, ready for it to really uh, work yet. But in the 90s, adaptive optics started to be developed on, on ground-based telescope. Uh, so here's an example on the right uh, on the Canada-France-Hawaii uh, telescope of an adaptive optic system, which was commissioned in the first half of the 90s. Um, and so one of the early adaptive optic systems. So what is adaptive optics? The, the drawing on the left shows the principle. We have aberrated light uh, coming uh, from the sky um, because it has been uh, disturbed by, by our atmosphere. And we can correct it and form a sharp image if we use uh, a corrector element, typically a mirror uh, of which we can change the shape very rapidly. And if we find the shape that exactly compensates the optical aberration that were introduced by the atmosphere, uh, we can form a sharp image. Um, so to do this, there's another very key element, which is a wavefront sensor. We need an optical sensor, which will measure in real time what is exactly the shape of this distortion. Uh, once that shape is known, a computer can process the, the data from the wavefront sensor, issue a command to the correcting element the deformable mirror, uh, such that uh, uh, the image is, is, is made sharp again. This loop, this control loop, needs to happen fairly quickly on the order of one kilohertz, 1,000 times per second. The shape of the mirror needs to be adapted. The reason for this is, is this is the time scale over which atmospheric turbulence uh, will uh, change the shape of the wavefront, the, the shape of the image. Uh, so as you can see on the right, uh, this technology adaptive optics has been quite successful. And uh, very early on, it was mostly successful over a fairly narrow field of view, looking at relatively bright objects. This is the case where you can use the object itself as the probe, as the light source to uh, measure the atmosphere. And, uh, and, 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 and this is what the first adaptive optics did quite successfully. Um, this technology has been perfected, improved, uh, thanks to uh, advances in technologies in detectors, but also the, 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 the adaptive mirrors themselves. So uh, here's an example of, uh, of, of the planet Uranus uh, image with Hubble on the left, uh, space telescope 2.4 meters. So this image is in the near infrared uh, and it is diffraction limited. So it is at the, the theoretical limit of what the telescope can achieve in terms of sharpness. And on the right, uh, the planet imaged by the Keck telescope uh, with an aperture of 10 meters using adaptive optics. So suddenly we, we see that on, on this type of target, bright uh, targets, uh, using adaptive optics, we can actually recover what has been uh, blurred by the atmosphere. We can, work, we can have the telescope work at its diffraction limit um, and large ground-based telescopes uh, 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 of, of the class uh, five to 10 meter uh, can deliver on these objects images that are sharper than Hubble. So this, this has been very successful, um, but uh, adaptive optics, uh, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, was sort of stuck in that mode. Uh, it could only work on, on relatively bright targets, uh, usually stars or, or small size planets. Uh, there's also a field of adaptive optics that works on the sun. Um, Obviously, they don't have the same challenges in terms of object brightness as uh, nighttime astronomers do. Um, but fundamentally, the reason uh, we need a bright target in adaptive optics is that um, if, the, if the star is too faint, uh, we cannot, it does not have sufficient light so that we can probe the uh, atmospheric turbulence fast enough to catch up with the atmosphere changes, which happen on a millisecond time scale. The next big uh, revolution in adaptive optics was uh, the, the use of laser guide stars. So suddenly, we did not depend anymore on the presence of a bright star uh, in the middle of the image. We could use lasers to create that star anywhere in the sky. So suddenly, adaptive optics went from being a technology that can only work on relatively bright stars and, 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 and nearby objects such as uh, planets 
uh, to uh, something that could deploy, be deployed pretty much anywhere in the sky. Uh, and, and probably the most uh, successful, one of the most successful example of using adaptive optics with laser guide star uh, is the galactic center observation. So uh, uh, on the left, you can see an image of our galactic center in the near infrared. Uh, this was taken uh, by the UC, UCLA group, galactic center group using Keck. Um, the galactic center uh, has a black hole. Uh, which uh, is a fascinating object. And the, um, um, the, the motivation here was to look at stars that are close to the black hole, characterize their orbits, uh, so that we could constrain. First, we could confirm that there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy, but then also constrain its mass. And the, the animation on the right compares the image quality uh, uh, we get with without adaptive optics with a large telescope, with adaptive optics with Keck. So here is seeing limited. When we turn adaptive optics on, we start to resolve individual stars. Uh, this is for a 10 meter telescope for Keck. We can uh, measure their orbit. And then if we move to a larger telescope, a future telescope, 30 meter in this case, the image is considerably sharper uh, and, and, and the orbits are very well defined. This observation requires laser guide star. Uh, and, and it has been quite a revolution in adaptive optics that uh, we have been able to transition from only observing bright stars uh, to, um, to being able to perform observation basically anywhere in the sky uh, we want. The, the remaining challenge that, that, that was more recently solved and it's still in the process of being solved is field of view. Uh, it, it happens that when we do uh, adaptive optics correction, that correction is valid over a single small patch in the sky. If we are trying to look at objects that are, let's say, uh, 10 arc seconds away from where we do the correction, we start to see that the atmosphere, the path through which the light traveled is not the same and uh, the correction is no longer uh, very good. Um, and if you look very closely in the image on the left, if you zoom in, you can actually see some of that happening. The corners are not as sharp. Um, so the next big revolution, which is ongoing in adaptive optics, is to extend the field of view so that we can uh, obtain images uh, uh, that are sharp, but also wide field, like the image I showed uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and this is getting quite challenging because uh, we can no longer perform the correction with a single adaptive mirrors. We need multiple mirrors uh, because the correction needs to be field dependent. We also can no longer use a single star, whether it's a natural star or a laser guy star, to make the measurement because we need to make uh, to have some, some 3D volumetric understanding of the atmospheric turbulence. And all of this needs to run in real time. Um, so uh, as shown in the diagram on the, on the right here, uh, doing so involves multiple guide stars, uh, multiple wavefront sensors. So we, we can measure the atmospheric turbulence along several uh, line of sights. And to perform the correction, we need multiple uh, DMs, multiple deformable mirrors, um, so that the correction itself is also field dependent. Um, so the, the, the level of optical hardware and, and, and cameras that need to be deployed is, is quite a bit more. And also the control load, the, the computer needs to be a lot more powerful uh, to reconstruct all this information. Uh, but this is starting to work. Here is an example. This is an example uh, taken with the GEMS instrument uh, on, on, on Gemini South. Uh, you can see a laser, uh, which, which if you zoom in, is no longer a single laser. There is a constellation of five spots. The, this is what fundamentally gives the volumetric information. Uh, the, the system measures the wavefront uh, coming back from these five spots, no longer from a single spot. And here's a beautiful wide field image example. Uh, so we're starting to have images that look uh, uh, like the images Hubble Space Telescope can take, wide field of view, very sharp. Uh, and what's very exciting is we, we are starting to be able to do this with large diameter telescopes so that we have uh, not, not only a very good angular resolution, but also combined with very, very high sensitivity. So if we recap a little bit the grounds that we have covered so far, uh, there, are two, there are really two major things that we care about with adaptive optics. 
uh, that drive a lot of the design and also uh, how difficult it will be. Uh, the first one is how good is the wavefront quality? How good is the image quality? Uh, so here uh, is, it's expressed on the vertical axis as, as a, the nanometer residual wavefront error. So the lower part of this means very high quality. Uh, and the top part means that uh, we're only doing a partial correction of, of the atmospheric wavefront. And, and the other thing that matters is the field of view over which we achieve this quality. So from zero uh, on the left, which means we only achieve it for a single star on axis, uh, to larger field of view uh, going uh, to several arc minutes. And quite naturally, the top left corner is the easy one. This is where adaptive optics historically started. And adaptive optics is expanding and branching out uh, towards uh, the left, towards the right and the bottom. Um, so the right is again wider field of view, and the bottom is higher uh, uh, quality of correction. And 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 the reasons why things get harder when we move uh, to the right and the bottom are, are there are multiple reasons. But for example, one. One of them is if we start crossing this, this line, this, this diagonal line, one laser guide star is no longer sufficient to gain enough information. And, and also if we cross this line, we need more than one uh, uh, correcting element. So the optical design becomes harder. Uh, as we increase the field of view, the optic size grows also larger um, to maintain the field of view. Uh, and as we go to the bottom part of this graph, where, when we want to achieve excellent correction, uh, of atmospheric turbulence. We need more actuators, more degrees of freedom in both the, the correcting element and the sensor. Uh, we also need to run faster. Um, and one motivation to go to a higher level of correction is also to access shorter wavelengths. Adaptive optics has been extremely successful in the near infrared, uh, where the wavelength is on the order of one to two micron. But as we reduce the wavelength to, to the optical, to maintain the diffraction limit of the telescope, we need to go to the lower part of this graph where, where things get, uh, get harder. So um, as, uh, as Larry uh, mentioned when he introduced me, my area of expertise is, is the lower left corner. It's uh, what we call uh, extreme adaptive optics. Uh, I am designing uh, systems that are aimed at finding and imaging exoplanets, planets around other stars, we don't need field of view. Uh, we're looking for planets that are uh, very close to stars, um, but we need extremely good corrections. This is the lower left corner of this of this graph. So this is what I will use uh, my remaining time to talk a little bit more about. So when we when we try to do what we call extreme adaptive optics, we're trying to take a wavefront uh, that that comes into the, the the telescope with this level of aberration that's typically more than a micron and correct it so that we do an exquisitely good job at removing all of the um, low order aberrations. So all, all we're left with is, is very fine, uh, small errors. And the corresponding image in the focal plane looks like this. So if we, this is a two by two hexagon image. If we don't do any AO correction, this is what a star looks like, a, a very large fuzzy blob. When we turn on the adaptive, the extreme optic adaptive correction, then we do a very, uh, exquisite job at correcting the aberration and, and we have an image that's limited by diffraction instead of atmospheric turbulence. And then we deploy a chronograph to remove that diffraction so we can search for planets. So I'll talk a little bit more about the details of this. So before I go into the adaptive optics part, I think it's, 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 it's good to, to first mention uh, and highlight the motivation, the scientific motivation for this. Um, one of the most exciting uh, findings in science in, in the last few decades is the fact that most stars in our galaxy have uh, planets uh, that are orbiting them, and that a significant fraction of these planets are potentially habitable. There are rocky planets of size and mass similar to Earth, and they orbit in what we call the habitable zone of their stars. So their surface temperature is such that liquid water could exist and life as we know it could be sustained. Um, some spectacular example of, of such planets are, are shown in this slide. The TRAPPIST-1 system, seven planets, uh, only 40 light years away. Uh, three of these planets are uh, potentially in the habitable zone. Um, 
the Proxima Centauri B planet. Uh, so Proxima Centauri is the nearest, the closest star to us, only uh, 4.2 light years away. Uh, and, and it has a planet, Proxima Centauri B, which is in the habitable zone. And it will be uh, one of the very first targets we will point large telescope at uh, to see if we can image the planet and, and characterize it. Um, I often get asked, and I think many of my co colleagues also get the same question, do I think that uh, there is life somewhere in the galaxy? Um, and I think the answer is, is undoubtedly yes, just because of statistics. There are about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. Um, we think at least 10% of these stars have potentially habitable planets, rocky planets in their habitable zone. So that's about 30 billion stars. Um, that's a huge number. And to, to explain how big this number is, we can play this little analogy. If we had 100 explorers, uh, that uh, essentially each took 1% uh, of the sample, that's only 300 million planets per explorer, and we each spent only 10 seconds on each planet we were uh, in our sample, it would take 95 years to complete, uh, to complete this, uh, this sample of our galaxy. And that's just for our galaxy. Um, there are uh, 200 billion galaxies in the observable, observable universe. So the search for life outside of our solar system uh, is not so much a search of whether there is life outside of our solar system. It's, it's where it is, where is the closest example of life outside of our solar system, and how well can we uh, observe it and characterize it. So going back to, um, to direct imaging, there are multiple ways to find planets, uh, and, and taking images of them is, is probably just about the hardest one. Um, there are much uh, more powerful and easier ways to find planets, the transit technique, waiting for a planet to pass in front of its star and block some of its light, um, or radial velocity, uh, looking at the Doppler shift of the starlight uh, to uh, detect the wobble induced by an orbiting planet, or astrometry, looking at the position of the star in the sky to uh, detect the same wobble. Uh, the real reason we want to image planets is not to find out how many planets there are, it's to characterize them. If we can image a planet, we can isolate its light, we can feed it into a spectrograph, and we can do chemical analysis of its atmosphere. Uh, we can even find evidence for life, what we call biomarkers. So here is a beautiful example of, of, of the process uh, actually done on a spectra of Earth. And um, quite cleverly, this spectra was not acquired by sending a spacecraft that looks back at Earth. It was acquired by looking at the moon uh, when there's a thin crescent of the moon, the bright side of the moon, the thin crescent, is illuminated, illuminated by sunlight. But the other side of the moon, which is faintly visible here, is illuminated by Earth light. So essentially, the Earth, as seen from the moon, is fairly bright and illuminates uh, this part of the moon. So we can take a spectra of, uh, of the left side, divide it by a spectra on the right side, and we have the reflectance spectra of Earth, which is shown on the right here. And, and, and it's quite amazing that just by looking at this, we get a lot of information. We can see water, uh, we can see oxygen. There was a very strong oxygen band at 760 nanometer. We can see Rayleigh scattering in the blue, uh, which, which indicates that, confirms that we have, Earth has an atmosphere. Uh, we can even see uh, the vegetation uh, jump here, the vegetation bump in the very near infrared. Um, so this, this is exactly the type of data we would love to be taking uh, on for other planets, for exoplanets that are, of, that are in habitable zones of nearby stars. So why haven't we done this? Why is it hard? Um, this picture maybe, cap, maybe illustrates it quite beautifully. This is a picture that, that was taken by the Cassini spacecraft uh, before it plunged in, in the atmosphere of Saturn. Uh, in this specific picture, the spacecraft is in the shadow of Saturn and it's looking back towards the sun. So we can see the, the beautiful uh, scattered light, uh, sunlight by the, the rings. Uh, but uh, what's more important in this picture for, for what I want to talk about is this little dot here, which probably you can barely see. So I'm going to zoom in. Uh, this is us. Every one uh, of us is on that pixel. That's Earth as seen. Uh, from the spacecraft uh, in the vicinity of Saturn. And when we leave 
the inner part of our solar system and look back at Earth. It, it is very faint, it's very close to the sun. The, the flux ratio between Earth and the sun is on the order of a billion to one. So it's extremely challenging uh, to see Earth from, from far away. And this is exactly the problem we face when trying to image exoplanets or other storms. Uh, exoplanets are very faint uh, and they're very close to, 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 the, to the stars, their orbit, and the flux ratio between the two is, is millions to billions. So how do we go about solving this problem? Um, there, there, there's a growing number of people, uh, a growing community uh, working on specifically this challenge. Um, so there are uh, so-called extreme adaptive optics instrument on current large ground-based telescopes, uh, five to 10 meter diameter. And uh, we are not at the point where, where we can take images of Earth-like planets, but we're, we're, we're doing a lot of progress in developing the technologies and in the process also being able to image uh, more massive planets. Um, so I lead a team at the Subaru telescope, uh, which is shown in this slide here. This is an 8.2 uh, meter uh, diameter telescope. Um, so to give you a sense of scale, uh, this is the, 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 the telescope is inside the dome. And this is a, this is a door, which probably a regular sized door, which you can probably barely see. Um, and yes, there is snow in Hawaii, not all the time, but if you're at uh, 4,200 meter elevation, 14,000 feet, uh, we do get snow. Uh, so it's an excellent site, uh, high elevation, very good seeing transparent atmosphere. Uh, and that's where astronomers like to put uh, telescopes. Um, and uh, if we open the dome, we can see the, 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 the telescope. So the light enters from the top of this picture. It bounces on the uh, primary mirror, which is 8.2 meter diameter telescope. And then when we use adaptive optics to look for exoplanets, uh, at the top of the telescope is a, a, a secondary mirror. Light comes back down to a tertiary mirror, which can send the light on one of the two sides. And that's where our instrument sits. So here we're moving on the side of the telescope. The telescope is actually behind this uh, wall on the right. Light comes from the right. It is processed by, uh, by the adaptive optics instrument. So there is a first layer of correction on the right here. And then uh, there is fine correction and removal of starlight uh, in, in this box. And uh, the, the boxes on the outside are the cameras that capture the science light. This picture. Uh, was taken during the day. So we have people working on the instrument during the day. But at night, everyone leaves the platform and the instrument, everything goes dark in the platform and the instrument starts uh, acquiring data. And this is what uh, happens at night. Uh, so we have the, the, the team at the, at the, at the summit uh, controlling the telescope and the instruments. And we have uh, remote connections uh, uh, for, in this case, I was I happen to be remote, and, and other uh, team members uh, are often also remote. So what's amazing in in extreme adaptive optics instruments, if you open these panels and you look inside the instrument itself, everything is very small. Uh, the instrument is not very big; it's, it's actually by today's standards of of, uh, of astronomical instrument, it's, it's fairly modest in size. Uh, but it is very dense. There are lots of sensors, mirrors, uh, optics to cancel starlight, uh, multiple wavefront sensors running at high speed, filters, dichroics, moving stages. Um, we like to look at starlight in, in, in incredible detail with, at multiple wavelengths so we can very, uh, very accurately and precisely measure incoming wavefront errors so that we can correct them and calibrate our images. Um, so it's, it's quite striking that when you look at the instrument, when you look inside the instrument, the beam size is tiny. The largest uh, beam size in the whole instrument is about two centimeter. So we take an eight meter uh, beam size from the telescope and we collapse it into basically centimeter scale beam. And we can get away with that because our field of view is so small. There is an invariant in optic which states that if you compress your uh, beam by a factor X, uh, you will uh, uh, you will also uh, expand your angles. Uh, so e e e essentially, if you if you compress by a factor x, you will expand uh, the angle by another factor x. So for here, we go from roughly uh, uh, eight meter to eight millimeters. That's a thousand times compression. So our angles get multiplied by a thousand. If you wanted to have 
a one degree field of view in your instrument, you could not do that. You cannot have angles that are a thousand degrees across. Uh, but if your if your angle on the sky is an hexagon or less, uh, you can do that, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, I want to make that point because it also means that building these types of instruments for larger telescopes uh, is not so much a challenge in terms of optomechanics because uh, we can keep everything small. So how do we go about doing high contrast imaging with adaptive optics? Uh, there are really three ingredients. Uh, we need uh, an extreme AO correction to correct for atmospheric turbulence. So this is what I described. Uh, then we need a chronograph to mask starlight. So we can, uh, we can not avoid being uh, blinded by the glare of the bright star. And these two usually are not enough. They're actually never enough. We also need smart image processing to uh, pull out the signal from the planet. And, and that also ties in with the design of the camera and instrument that captures that light. So here's the process uh, illustrated. Uh, so on those three images are simulations. So I think I showed that before. This is a two by two hexagon field of view. Um, the, the image without adaptive optics looks very blurry. We have no hope of imaging a planet here. Then we turn on the other extreme adaptive optics correction. We get to this stage. Suddenly there's a transition. We, we On the left, our image was dominated by atmospheric turbulence. Here we are dominated by diffraction, by the, the, the fundamental diffraction of the telescope. What we see is airy rings. We see uh, spider diffraction. So this is all static effects that are uh, fundamentally due to the exact mathematical shape of the telescope uh, primary mirror. Uh, so we deploy a chronograph to cancel this. All of this is very well known. We can compute it. We can measure it. It's stable. So we can design an optical element that will remove it. And when we do this, we get to this stage where we are, again, dominated by residual atmospheric turbulence, but at a much uh, smaller level. Uh, so how dark this image will be is a function of how well we've done our extreme AO correction. And then we do some image processing to pull up planets. So this is an example of an image uh, we took. Uh, this is a well-known planetary system. It has four planets. Uh, this image is fairly narrow field, so we can only see three of the four planets. The fourth one is further out. Uh, but those are the key elements. So again, extreme adaptive optics correction, chronography, and then image processing. Um, and, and, and so what we, what we need to do is is push this to higher performance. So the, again, this is actually another image of the same system. Uh, we can see the four planets here. The planets uh, that we image with current telescopes are, are large planets. These planets are five to seven Jupiter masses. They're also fairly young, uh, so they're still glowing bright in the near infrared where this image is taken. But what we want, but what we want to do is go closer in and, and fainter, deeper. But when you try to do this, you can see that there is noise here. There's a lot of speckled noise residual starlight that we haven't been able to remove uh, perfectly. So we need to improve uh, our, our, our tools to do this. Uh, and this is exactly what we are doing currently on large telescopes. So I, I showed the, the, uh, the hardware on the Subaru telescope. Uh, I also work on another system, which is, uh, which is doing very similar work uh, on the Magellan telescope. This is a, a six and a half meter uh, telescope in the Southern hemisphere in Chile. Um, and, and there's a, a, the Magewa X system is, is uh, following the same path, essentially uh, combining extreme adaptive optics with chronography uh, and uh, image processing to do high contrast imaging. Uh, so um, these are uh, first on sky results uh, where uh, this is actually in the visible, sort of at the boner in the red visible, just at the boner between visible and near infrared. And we can recover the diffraction limit of the telescope. Um, and this is the system uh, installed on the side of the telescope. So these two systems are, are, are very representative and, and sort of leading the way into developing and validating new technologies on sky uh, so that we can, uh, with larger telescopes, we can image habitable planets. Uh, and in the process, we also are imaging uh, planets uh, like Jupiter-sized planets around nearby stars and also disks. So, what really excites us is, is the, uh, the larger telescopes. Uh, there are three main projects, three projects. Uh, the 30 meter telescope uh, shown in this picture will be in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't think I need to tell you how big it is. It's in the name. Uh, 
uh, and the giant Magellan telescope, 25 meters across, different design, uh, fewer, larger segments. Each of the segments is, is 8.4 meter across. Um, these telescopes are really uh, uh, very big, and, and, and it's not just the incremental gain over what we are doing. It's, it's completely transformative uh, for exoplanet imaging. Just to give you a sense of the scale, I don't know if you can see, but this is a person sitting at the bottom of the telescope. When I was a grad student, I was amazed at seeing uh, 10 meter class telescopes and, and a, a person next to next to the telescope to give scale, uh, but it's no longer sufficient with this big telescope. Now, the, I think the, the new template is a, is a truck. So you can see the truck on the, on the lower right here to give a sense of scale. And the European extremely large telescope, which would be 39 meter across. Again, there's a truck to give the scale in the lower left here. So these three telescopes are really going to be uh, game changers for exoplanet imaging. They will uh, transition us from uh, being able to only image Jupiter-like planets to being able to image Earth-like planets around nearby stars. Uh, so this is terribly exciting and, and, and our community is working very hard to get ready for, for these telescopes. Um, so there are multiple teams working on instrument designs, a, a, a very active area of research. As I mentioned, uh, we're not just designing uh, instruments for uh, this large telescope. We are testing uh, this instrument and their concepts on current telescopes. Uh, so it's a very active feedback between design cycles and tests, test of new technologies on sky. And the technology is moving very quickly uh, uh, in, in a very positive way. So I think our community is actually very optimistic that we will be able to image uh, Earth-like planets with these telescopes. So um, to give you a sense of, of, of what we're thinking, um, this is the, the design for, for the instrument for GMT, the Giant Magellan Telescope. The instrument is named GMAG uh, it, it is led by Jared Mails at the University of Arizona. Uh, this is a, a CAD model of the instrument. So you can see it's, it's big, but it's not huge. It's, it's especially by the standards of, of, of large 30 meter class telescope. The instrument is actually quite modest in size because it does not need to uh, be concerned about field of view. Um, so, um, so you can, everything happens in this optical bench, which combines uh, very precision wavefront uh, control, extreme adaptive optics, chronography, and, uh, and detection of, of, of the light of the planet, and, and then it's spectroscopy. Uh, what's really exciting is when we look at what this instrument uh, should be able to do, um, and, and we look at the planets that, that, that should be detectable, that should be, uh, uh, that we should be able to image. Uh, there's quite a few of them. And if we look at the planet radius on this vertical axis here, we can see that the giant planets are, are, are up there, sort of Jupiter size, but there's quite a few of small rocky planets um, going down all the way to one uh, Earth radius that should be accessible. And, and uh, the, the gray zone here is the habitable zone. Some of them will be in habitable zone. So those will be uh, the prime targets. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, the, the TMT planetary system imager is, 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 uh, is another instrument that, that has similar science goals. Um, and so uh, both teams are actually collaborating on, on a lot of the technologies. Um, so the, 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 the planetary system imager, PSI, has a broad wavelength coverage and also uh, aims at doing spectroscopy uh, all the way from visible uh, to, uh, to actually the, the, the infrared. So the instrument has, has, has three main modules. There is PSI red for the near infrared, PSI blue for the visible and very near infrared and PSI uh, 10 uh, for uh, thermal light. Um, so the, the, these instruments, there's already designs, concepts, and, and uh, a lot of these uh, elements are being tested on current large ground-based telescopes. So when we look at what this instrument should be able to do, um, uh, this is an example with a nominal 30 meter uh, uh, telescope diameter. And here we're looking at, at, at how many stars or on how many stars, if there was a habitable planet, the planet could be imaged and, and a spectra could be taken of this planet. And, and the different panels show uh, different wavelengths. So uh, I band is right at the boundary between visible and, and infrared and K-band is, is further at longer wavelength in infrared. Um, the horizontal axis is the angular separation between the planet and the star, and the vertical axis is the contrast. 
As we move to longer wavelengths, the angular resolution of the telescope uh, is becoming le uh, less good. So we lose the inner targets. So basically um, the inner planets are invisible when we move too much to the infrared. Uh, however, the adaptive optics works better in the infrared than the visible. Uh, so we have access to deeper contrast when we go to longer wavelengths. And so there is a balance, there's a trade-off between these two. Um, and, and, and the optimal uh, wavelength range seems to be right in the, uh, in, in the infrared, very near infrared, maybe around one, one and a half micron. Um, and depending on the exact performance of the system, we can go a little bit bluer, uh, uh, if, especially if we do very good on the wavefront uh, correction. And, and, and that's very interesting because that's exactly the wavelength range where we can detect uh, water, oxygen, CO2, so the main uh, molecules that we want to detect in, in uh, exoplanets atmospheres as biomarkers are right where we think our instruments will work the best. Um, oxygen at uh, 760 nanometer has a very strong absorption band. There's also a weaker absorption band for oxygen at 1.3 micron. Uh, water is, is of course all over the near infrared, uh, so much so that we have to worry about also the, 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 the interplay between the water on the exoplanet and the water in our, our own uh, Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but th this wavelength range will be extremely valuable. Um, and I, I, I didn't have to talk about, about this, but there's a second path, which is mostly uh, pursued by the ELT with the METIS instrument, which is to go at 10 micron, where the planet, an Earth-like planet is actually quite bright. Uh, at 10 micron, much longer wavelength, the angular resolution of the telescope is not very good. Uh, because the wavelength is so much larger. However, the planet is very bright. Uh, and so uh, around a small number of, of sun-like stars, uh, the METIS instrument uh, and, and, and possibly other 10 micron instruments that are being conceptualized right now uh, could also detect uh, uh, Earth-like planets. Um, but most, most of the research that I'm involved in is, is working in the near infrared, sort of between 0.6 and, uh, and 3 micron. So I want to I want to conclude by 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 summarizing a little bit of the grounds I've covered and and, and discussing briefly where things are moving uh, in adaptive optics. Uh, in the first sort of part of my lecture, I, I I gave a very broad overview of what adap why adaptive optics is so important. As telescopes get larger, uh, it it is becoming more and more important uh, because the gap between a telescope, a ground-based telescope that does not have adaptive optics and one that has adaptive optics is becoming uh, uh, much larger in terms of performance um, uh, as the telescope size increases. Um, and, and the main reasons we do adaptive optics are, 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 are again, the sensitivity, the, um, the angular resolution, but that actually also plays in with sensitivity of the telescope. Uh, if we improve the angular resolution, we improve the sensitivity. So the technology keeps advancing. We have faster computers. Uh, we have a better algorithm. Um, we, uh, the detectors is a huge part of the development. So having cameras that are very high speed, uh, that have very low noise uh, and, and can even count individual photons at, in real time is extremely valuable and important for everything we're doing. And another technology area is in the optics, especially the, the deformable mirrors uh, with more and more elements. The newer deformable mirrors have thousands of elements across a single small mirror, and they can move at, at several kilohertz. All of this technology development is driving us in three main directions. The first one is we're, we keep improving the image quality. And a big motivation to do this is also to move to shorter wavelengths. Historically, adaptive optics has been very successful in the near infrared uh, because it was easier. The wavelength is longer and it's less hard to reach the diffraction limit of the telescope. Uh, we only need maybe 200 nanometer uh, uh, correction. So if we have 200 nanometer of residual wavefront error, we have the diffraction limit in the near infrared. Uh, but if we move to shorter wavelength, the angular resolution will get even better. And so there is, there's a lot of work going on in improving the image quality so we can have, a, especially in the optical and blue, uh, where we can get even sharper images. The, the second direction where we're making considerable progress is the wider field of view. As I explained, 
uh, it's a challenging uh, uh, thing to do in adaptive optics because suddenly we need multiple guide stars uh, and, and, and we need multiple deformable mirrors. But, but this is moving very well and, and, and wider field of view adaptive optic systems are being deployed on the, uh, on the current larger, largest telescopes. And then the last one that's very important is the sky coverage. Um, as I mentioned, when adaptive optics started, we could only look at, um, at basically bright stars or bright planets. Uh, uh, but with laser guide stars, we are uh, becoming able to, to point telescopes anywhere in the sky and turn on the adaptive optics. So the combination of those three things uh, will really uh, revolutionize uh, how we do astronomy in the optical and, and near infrared. And then the, the last part of my presentation was about extreme adaptive optics. This is what I work on. Um, and this is extremely exciting because I, I, I believe that the first opportunity we will have to get an image and a spectra of a, of a nearby habitable planet will be with the, the three uh, ELTs, the three large telescope, GMT, TMT, and ELT. Um, and and um, uh, in the US, uh, we're mostly involved uh, with the GMT and TMT, one of them in the Southern Hemisphere, the other one in the Northern Hemisphere. So both of them together will have access to the whole sky. Um, and these telescopes, I, I, I strongly believe, will be our first opportunity uh, to have spectra of habitable planets at a level where if there is water and oxygen, we will be able to detect it. Uh, and uh, this will really open uh, a, a new chapter in astronomy where we are uh, uh, not just guessing and modeling, but actually measuring uh, if there is uh, life on uh, other planets. Um, so that's my last slide. And uh, I think we have time for questions. Thank you. We do indeed have time for questions. And thank you uh, so much, uh, Olivier, for uh, what I have to say is, is kind of an overview. We might have to have you come back and, and, uh, and give a more, some more technical insight into uh, things like how deformable mirrors work and how wave fudge sensors work and how you model the um, atmospheric turbulence, which I guess is susceptible to a certain amount of mathematical modeling. But I guess we're not going to go into that here. So maybe I can get you to come back sometime. And, I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, let me say this is part of a series of lectures that we're having. So we've had um, one lecture already on the giant Magellan telescope. And the lecture following yours will be on the 30 meter. And then in the spring, we'll have a lecture on the um, European Extremely Large Telescope. So I think you know we'll have a good good idea of all this very exciting astronomy to come from these very remarkable um, telescopes that are being built. So let's go to questions. Let me start with a, a question of my own. Um, could you say a word about two things: the computational burden of these devices and what what kind of computer hardware you need to to keep up with the uh, load? Yes, so the, the computational requirements keep growing uh, because, uh, so just to give some numbers, the extreme AO systems typically have a few thousand degrees of freedom. That means there are a few thousand modes we control. Uh, the input is, uh, uh, the wavefront sensor input are cameras with, uh, with frame rates of a few kilohertz with uh, on the order of 100,000 pixels. Um, and uh, so we need to take this camera image, we need to process it in a way that we can measure the wavefront and then issue a command, a correction command. And we don't have much time to do that. We have essentially maybe 100 or 200 microseconds to complete that computation. Uh, so the challenges are twofold. First one is it's actually quite a heavy computational load the second one is it needs to be precisely timed. We cannot be late. Uh, and, and, and so it's, there's a real-time challenge. Uh, the, it's a real-time computing uh, uh, problem. Um, by and large, on current large telescopes, uh, we've been very fortunate that the compute hardware, uh, accelerated compute hardware, such as uh, uh, DSPs, FPGAs, or, or, or GPUs that we use quite a lot, have uh, caught up to our requirements. So we are able to do these computations in real time. And, um, and, and, and um, 
it, it seems that uh, we will also be able to meet those computational requirements on the larger telescopes. But we're very fortunate that we're not we're benefiting from this amazing growth in uh, computing performance, uh, and we're essentially riding that wave. Uh, and so I'll just quickly as a, a sort of ancillary. Um, how are we talking thousands of GPUs or tens of thousands of GPUs or several hundred GPUs? So for the systems uh, that we currently use, it's a few GPUs. Uh, a few. We typically okay. use a few GPUs. So each of the GPU are, has on the order of maybe 5,000 compute cores. Uh, so the number of compute cores we use is a few tens of thousands uh, at a frequency of about uh, two gigahertz. Okay. We have a question from Ron Eckers. Ron, can you unmute and ask your question? Um, uh, this is Ron Eckers, um, watching uh, your uh, wonderful talk from Australia. Um, it's a technical question, but you mentioned having coronagraph to remove the bright star. Uh, it wasn't clear to me whether you're referring to a physical uh, device which blocks part of the field of view or whether this is a computational uh, thing done in the digital image. And I'm asking because, as you probably know, in the radio, we subtract the bright sources using digital. But if you do it physically, that's interesting. And maybe we should discuss. Very good question. It we do it physically. Uh, so we do it with optical masks uh, that block the starlight. Because the source of the problem is diffraction, those masks are tend to be a little bit more complicated than just a black dot. Uh, because we have to design them so that they match the diffraction pattern. Um, but fundamentally, there's, there, there, there's two fundamental reasons why we need to do it physically, and we cannot do it uh, very well computationally. The first one is photon noise. Uh, when we, if we leave too much starlight on top of the planet, uh, the shot noise that comes along with that starlight will uh, prevent our detection from uh, of the very faint planet light. So the, the planet light, especially on the most challenging planet, we may only have uh, maybe 10 photons per second coming from the planet. If we let 100 or 1,000 photons per second coming from the star, the shot noise from that will, will hurt our sensitivity and and, and, and even prevent detection. The second reason is that um, our main enemy uh, is, uh, is, are the speckles, these very small uh, wavefront aberrations uh, that uh, create this essentially fake planet images that pop up uh, randomly. And, if we, and those speckles are made out of coherent starlight. If we let them interfere with a strong coherent starlight term, they will get amplified. Uh, there will be a sort of uh, ampli coherent amplification of those speckles. Uh, so we, those are the two reasons why we, uh, we need to do this optically and we cannot just uh, do it uh, in post-processing. That being said, we do our best possible job doing it optically, but we don't do it perfectly. So we still do post-processing uh, to touch up the image uh, as best we can after the fact. Are we good? Thank you. Okay, and next question is from uh, PSW member and uh, lecture sponsor, Bob Terry. Bob, you want to mute your mic and ask a question? Okay, so you hear me all right? Yep. So if you reverse this problem, you look at the Earth's surface through a telescope and you apply adaptive optics, are the rules essentially the same? All I do is translate this dis distances and sizes, the angular resolutions are, and coverages and time scales are all about the same. It's um, kind of the same problem. Yes. So uh, the before I answer that, how you do it, I, I'm going to talk one minute about why. The, when we look through our atmosphere looking up, uh, the disturbance are close to us, but far from the object. Uh, right. When we look with telescopes down at Earth, it's the opposite. So the, the, the light is undisturbed until uh, basically the very, the, the very 
nearby surface uh, of the planet. It, it happens, it so happens that the effect is much less in that case. Uh, you, know, you can play this game where you, you take uh, maybe a, a, a piece of uh, a plastic that's a little frosted and, and, and kind of blurs things. If you try to look at something through it, it you won't see anything. But if you move, if you move that, that, that transparent sheet of, of, of uh, plastic right on top of the object you're looking at, you'll still see it sharp. Uh, so there is this, this fundamental difference that atmospheric turbulence, when you look down, is much less damaging when you look up. Uh, that being said, there is a whole branch of adaptive optics that works on a ground-based, uh, ground uh, propagation, uh, especially for telecommunication or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or laser propagation, uh, uh, especially if it's horizontal. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from a PSW member and sponsor, Carl Merrill, who is a molecular biologist by training, but he's avidly interested in physics. Thank you, Larry. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in astronomy, but haven't had much time to work on it. But uh, um, I try to keep up with, with what's going on. I, I, first, I, I commend you for the advances you've made in the adaptive optics. But one thing I've been concerned about lately are the, the constellations of communication satellites that are being sent up and, and wondered your comment on how the astronomy community plans to deal with that and, um, and how much of a threat is it. And then the other thing was that I was very impressed with the way the telescopes were linked together, the radio telescopes, to make an image of a black hole. And I've heard and seen in the popular press comments that by using quantum mechanics, um, it may be possible to do that with the visible spectrum. And I wondered if you could comment on that. So those are my two questions. All right, so um, the first question uh, about the satellites, constellation of satellites uh, damaging or, 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 or basically disturbing astronomical observations. Uh, this is a concern, but for for what we do with extreme adaptive optics imaging, it's much less of a concern. Our field of view is very small. So the uh, probability that uh, a satellite passes in the field of view is, is becoming very small. Uh, in addition, we, we, we typically do very short exposures. So uh, if um, very, we use high frame rate camera, short exposure. So if a satellite were to pass, in our field of view, which is very unlikely because our field of view is so small, uh, this would also uh, only uh, disturb a very short uh, period of time, uh, and and the, so so the probabilities are such that for what for exoplanet imaging, um, Earth orbiting satellites are not really a concern. They're not really something we worry about. It's much more of a concern for my colleagues who do uh, very deep wide field imaging. Uh, for two reasons, their field of view is larger, so the probability that the satellite passes through their field of view is much larger, uh, but also they tend to do very long exposures. They have huge cameras with large number of pixels, and they will open the shutter, expose for uh, sometimes up to half an hour, and then close the shutter. If during this half an hour, a satellite is passing, a bright satellite is passing through, that exposure is, is, uh, is compromised or even ruined. So again, for what I do, I don't um, I, I don't lose sleep over Earth, Earth orbiting, or orbiting satellites, but I'm, I'm sure some of my colleagues worry about it much more than I do. Um, For those of you who are are interested, let me just interject. We had a talk by Tony Tyson about this very subject last May. So if any of you who are listening are interested, you can go and, and look at that as a starting point. Sorry to interrupt. Second question. Thank you. Uh, the second question about interferometry, we actually are doing uh, interferometry uh, in some cases for uh, exoplanet observation. Uh, it's 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 in, in the optical uh, with telescopes that are uh, that are within maybe a few hundred meter of each other, uh, and that is uh, that is turning out to be very uh, helpful in in some cases. One of them uh, is if we if we observe in the thermal infrared. So instead of observing at in the visible, if we go to maybe 10 micron, and we want to see very close to uh, to stars, so maybe because we're looking at a star that's that's far away, uh, or because we want to study how, how planets form in the very inner regions of solar systems, 
And so there are projects that use interferometry. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the main examples, uh, there's the, the large binocular telescope interferometer in, in Arizona. Uh, there is the, the CAC interferometer also that has been doing interferometry. Uh, and uh, the VLT, a very large telescope, uh, a European project in Chile has four eight meter telescopes that are linked by interferometry plus uh, a few smaller ones. So this is already happening uh, in optical astronomy. Um, and and, and it's, it's, not, it's not the primary path through which we will be observing Earth-like planets uh, because for that we need uh, large single telescopes. Uh, but for some observations, interferometry is being uh, is, is actually very useful to resolve very fine structures, uh, especially in planet formation and young planets very close into stars. Thank you. I have a question coming through to from YouTube from uh, another PSW member, Claudio Caffi Rivella asks: Would there be a scientific benefit to operate one of your telescopes? from the ISS or other near orbital platforms? I think you might have to deconstruct that so, a little bit. All other things being equal, putting a telescope in space is a, is, is a fantastic idea. It's just logistically very uh, uh, very difficult, especially when the telescope is, is, is large. Um, the, um, you know, we can sort of work back from what do we need to observe at, at what wavelength we can translate that into a telescope diameter that can achieve this observation. Um, and and um, you know, the, it, then it depends on the type of planet we want to observe. And, and, and for example, uh, the, the JWST JW, James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launched shortly, uh, will be an infrared optimized telescope, uh, fantastically powerful to look at the thermal emission of Jupiter-like planets as long as they are far enough away from their star that the telescope can resolve them. Um, um, the, uh, I think some of my colleagues have been looking at concepts where small telescopes could be attached to the ISS. Um, and, and, and there's definitely very interesting things that, that have been explored. None of those have uh, transpired into a major project yet, but uh, who knows that that may happen. It, I think what I've heard from that community is that um, uh, it, 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 it can be easier in some case to just launch your telescope separately from the ISS than trying to attach it to the ISS because it's not very quiet. Uh, and, and, and if for the type of observation we're, we're interesting, interested in with space telescope, we really want telescopes to be extremely quiet, quiet environment, no vibration. Uh, so uh, I think the engineers are, are, are telling us, well, it's, it's easier to do that if you just let it fly on its own. So I'll interject a question related to our e earlier um, talk, the one just before you, which was one of a series on AI, but you were talking about smart image processing. And I guess with AIs, the big issue is what's your training set. But I wonder if you could say a few words about finding exoplanets and characterizing them using machine learning techniques. Yes, and that's a topic that, that's extremely excite, exciting to me and, and, and many of my colleagues. Um, so if we, if we go back to what limits us right now in, in imaging exoplanets, our main challenge is, uh, is those speckles, this, um, this, this little, this noise that, uh, here, I'll, I'll share my screen again. This noise that essentially uh, looks like uh, fake planets. So you can see a lot of, of, of them here. So this is the inner planet of this four planet, four planet planetary system. But if we try to get closer in, we get into this noise. Uh, here's another image. Uh, this is an on sky image. You can see this, what we call these speckles. They're all starlight, but, but, but they're really annoying because if there's a planet in there, uh, we'll, we'll miss it. We'll think it's a, it, it's a speckle. So there, there are main, uh, um, our main source of noise. So the, there is this whole uh, uh, branch of research in our communities. Can we use AI? Can we use image processing to figure out what is a speckle and what is a planet? If we had a computer and an algorithm that was smart enough to figure out 
uh, in this image, what is exactly starlight? We could remove that and be left with an image that has just photon noise, shot noise, uh, but no speckle noise, and, and we'd be much better off trying to image exoplanets. Um, the, the area that's especially interesting to me and, and, and many of my colleagues is that when we run our adaptive optic system at multiple kilohertz, we're constantly gathering all this data from our wavefront sensors. And the only thing we're doing with that data currently is we compute what to do to correct the wavefront. But we're starting to also store that data and explore if we can go back in time in post-processing and from that data, uh, reconstruct where starlight landed in our image. Uh, and so there's a huge field of research in trying to do this with, with new algorithms. Um, and it's extremely promising because if we think about it, um, the information is there. It's contained in our wavefront sensors. Where speckles land in the image or noise is already recorded uh, by these very fast wavefront sensors. And, and there's this whole field of trying to understand how to link those things together with algorithms um, and, and AI is, several of the AI techniques are look extremely promising. So very recently, for example, we did tests, very simple statistical test. We, we went on sky and, and in the lab and, and run our extreme AO systems. And, 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 and we asked ourselves, well, if, if, if we see, if at two different times, the wavefront sensor gives us the same measurement, is it also the case that the speckles will be the same in our science image? And the answer to that question was yes. Uh, therefore, uh, maybe not proving, but, but strongly suggesting that, that there is an algorithm that could be devised to go from one to the other. Uh, so this is, this is a very good question because um, this is where uh, personally I spend a lot of my time thinking about this uh, these days. And a lot of my colleagues are also working on this. Let's ask, get a question from Frederica. Uh, Frederica, you want to unmute your mic and ask a question? Yes. Um, good evening, Bonjour, uh, Olivier. Thank you very much for the very informative presentation. Um, so I asked my question when you showed uh, the, um, uh, together with the uh, slide that you said, the Saturn and, and the Earth being a point, and then he had shown also the spectrum that you said part of uh, that show that comes from the atmosphere, then from the flora on the earth and uh, something like that, that, right? You saw the spectrum there. And then uh, I, then at the end though, uh, later on, you kind of talked about how we detect uh, oxygen, hydrogen, water. How um, can you map the second set of data to the first uh, graph that you showed that, you know, because we talk about Earth-like kind of planets, and as you said, you know, so we want to detect something similar, uh, but perhaps even if it doesn't exactly like the Earth, you know, maybe we are not looking for humans exactly, but any kind of other living organism. But I was thinking how you map the, the second graph to the first one, is it possible? Yes, a very good question. A, a lot of my colleagues are, are working on that problem. There's a whole community in uh, astrobiology mm -hmm. uh, uh, being concerned about exactly that, that challenge. We, we only have one example of a spectra of, of, a, of a habitable planet with life, and that's, that's right. Earth. And, and, and so there is a, there's a large range of, of fairly complicated questions uh, as to what should we be looking for uh, when we look at a spectra of other planets. Should we be looking at the same features? Is life going to play out in such uh, uh, in a very similar way or completely mm -hmm. different? Um, and it's it's really an interplay between the, what the biology biology community is 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 is, is uh, thinking and learning about uh, about the process that are the processes of of, of of the biological processes and the way they interact with the atmosphere mm -hmm. of the planet, and also what we can measure on the instrument side. I'm mostly involved in the mm -hmm. instrument side. Um, I think the you know, one thing that, that seems to have been uh, uh, fairly compelling and, 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 and consistent over the last um, at least decade is, is uh, water and oxygen are, are good molecules to look for. Uh, the astrobiologists uh, don't all think that this is enough to confirm that there is life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a very complicated problem. Uh, one for which we do not have much data. 
uh, which of course adds to the challenge. Um, as, as an instrument builder, I'm, 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 I'm trying to keep track of, of what astrobi the astrobiology community tells us we should be looking for, but also keeping an eye on what our instruments uh, will be able to measure. Um, and so we're, you know, we've, we've what I described at the end of the presentation, our, our main window of opportunity, so to speak, in wavelength is going to be between visible and near infrared, uh, maybe between 0.5 micron and, and maybe three micron. And uh, we'll be able to look for oxygen, water, methane, uh, CO2. Um, and, and then yeah, I gave the example of, of uh, evidence of plant life on Earth from, from the spectra of Earth. That's, of course, uh, much more speculative in terms of uh, is, is this something that's going to be present on, on other planets? So very good question. I'm probably not the best person to answer this question, although I, I'm, I'm, I'm as eager as, as you are to know the answer to that question is what really should we be looking for and what will define, uh, what will serve essentially as a proof of, of biological activity in spectra of exoplanets. Thank you. We have a question from uh, down, another question from Australia, from uh, PSW member, Frank Robert. Hey Frank, good to hear from you. Can you turn your mic on and ask a question? Hi, I think this should be on. Uh, yep. Olivia, thank you very much for a, an absolutely fabulous talk. Um, my uh, question was, uh, as, as with the other from down under, I guess double. Uh, one was, uh, if we understand correctly that uh, quantum uh, computing is uh, particularly well able to simulate physical systems, is there a future of uh, uh, quantum computing back to uh, extreme adaptive optics uh, in the uh, your future, do you think? Um, and uh, the the other is just escape me. So that's the primary one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't. I think the short answer is I don't know. But uh, we 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 keep. You know, th there's this interplay oh, okay. between new ideas in terms of algorithm we want to deploy and and compute capabilities. So far, we we're sort of on par with what compute capabilities can offer, but. Uh, but we, especially on the larger telescope, the scale of the system will be uh, will be larger. And and uh, and I, I just mentioned new concepts for AI to solve some of our most challenging uh, problems. Um, so I, you know, I, I think we'll we'll definitely be happy customers of any new uh, compute technology that that can push beyond what what we can currently do. Um, that's probably. The own the best as best as I can answer this question. I, I I'm not you know I, I I I'm curious about quantum computing. Following what what it can do, it, it hasn't really hit mainstream yet, but I'm I'm sure at some point it will, and we'll be paying at very close attention to it. No, that's a good answer. Thank you. And the other half of the question was, uh, you mentioned the differences between uh, uh, the astronomical adaptive optics and uh, communications adaptive optics. Would it be possible to say just a couple of sentences about that? Um, yes, uh, so uh, the, the communication adaptive optics is, is, is concerned with uh, um, mostly with horizontal propagation uh, between buildings, for example, um, and, and their challenges are, 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 are somewhat similar. Uh, there are, there's a few differences. One of them is that uh, they, they can have brighter sources than, than we do. Uh, in astronomy, we tend to be photon starved. We 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 have limited amount of light, and we need to work with that light. So I think the the major difference between uh, adaptive optics for astronomy and adaptive optics outside of astronomy is, uh, is 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 that is the flux limit that that astronomers are constantly uh, bumping against. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, Leo communication among. Leo constellation elements and with the with the ground that uh, are where there's been a lot of uh, adaptive optics uh, starting to show up that may overlap more with what you are doing. Yes, but, but I thank you for that uh, good answer. Thanks, Larry. Well, it's a related question: Is the turbulence that you encounter in a horizontal communications transmission near the ground different, materially different than? what you see when you're going, you know, perpendicularly down through the atmosphere from a point source in space? Um, it, it, it depends on the 
propagation length, uh, the propagation distance. So uh, when we look up, we essentially experience the strong ground turbulence from maybe 100 meter or so. And then as we go higher, turbulence gets weaker and weaker. So if you're trying to do horizontal propagation across uh, maybe a few hundred meters, the level of aberration you, you, you experience is somewhat similar to what astronomers experience looking up. Uh, one big difference uh, is that astronomers typically have bigger beam size, so they catch a larger fraction of a larger uh, patch of the atmosphere. So there's a fundamental difference there. Um, in some cases, ground horizontal propagation goes over much larger distance, kilometers. And then uh, they're in a regime of turbulence, which is actually stronger than what astronomers have to deal with. But the nature of the distortions is essentially the same. The nature is the same. The physical uh, origin of the distortion is the same. It's, uh, it's basically uh, variations in the, in the density of, of, of air, uh, which are themselves due to uh, uh, inhomogeneities in temperature. Right. OK. Uh... Uh, a sort of a follow-up question from Frederica. She wants to know, she's sort of saying, but asking, uh, quantum, will quantum be relevant for signals communication across widely distributed telescopes? And I think this relates back to Carl Merrill's question in part of, will quantum enable longer baseline interferometric uh, um, methods for, for combining many telescopes. Ah, okay, thank you, unmute me. Uh, ah, so okay. I, what I was going to say is, as you said, you know, for computation, I mean, you have your GPUs, you know, 20,000, 25,000 uh, GPUs are sufficient, but I was thinking quantum uh, will be in communication if you want to kind of, uh, you know, have uh, signals from multiple telescopes that you could combine to, in a sense, improve your accuracy, that, you know, where quantum could be used. It's uh, okay. not for computation, for communication. Yeah, so one interesting thing with our application is, is much of it is, is, is what is so-called edge computing. Our computing is, is mm -hmm. um, you know, when, as, as I mentioned, most of what we do is with single telescopes. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we do interferometry, it's, it's not over a very large uh, baseline, typically mm -hmm. when we look at exoplanets, because mm -hmm. um, the, separate, the angular separation between a star and a planet is such that uh, you know going beyond a few hundred meters doesn't really get us anything. Um, I, I, so I'll give two answers. The, the short term answer is is that when we think about interferometry for imaging exoplanets, we're not really thinking long baseline interferometry, um, and so we're we're somewhat conventional in that in in, in that sense. And our computing uh, to support this uh, tends to be localized. The way we transport light is, is conventional. We, we transport actual light beams and interfere them. Um, so that's the sort of conventional short-term answer. There is a, a bigger long-term goal, which is quite far in the future, but which, which, which is extremely exciting, is maybe one day we will have the ability to deploy interferometers that have baselines of thousands of kilometers. So instead of just imaging a planet like Earth, and seeing it as a dot, we can resolve its surface. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the engineering challenges to do this are, are absolutely crazy. This, this is going to be very hard. It's going to take some time. Uh, but maybe your question uh, about these future technologies is more related to that goal, that long-term yes. goal uh, of being able to fly maybe in space uh, a flotilla of, of, of 10 meter size telescopes mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a thousand kilometers apart from each other and being able to take an image or resolve the image where we can image details on the surface of a of, 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 of an Earth-like planet or on another star. That's extremely exciting, yeah, right. quite far in the future. I think I think that your question, you know, this and, and by extension, the, the, the new technologies that that will come in the next uh, sort of decades will, will really be applicable to that goal. Yes, thank you. That's my, that's the great the spirit of my comment. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll end with this question here uh, from uh, our our member down in Colombia, Neil. He asks uh, Colombia, South America, <laughs> not Colombia, South Carolina. <laughs> uh, what are the chances that the ExoLife Finder telescope can image exoplanets? 
It helps to use complex math and interference to image exoplanets, land, ocean, and ice cap regions. In other words, we're going to be able to see these planets. So the, uh, the, the exolife concept is, is one of these future large telescope concepts that uh, I didn't have time to cover. But you know, the, the, I, I, this is linked to the, the previous question, actually. They're, they're short term, what we will be able to do is take images where the planet is, is separated from the star, but not yet have the angular resolution to, uh, to, to take a resolved image of the planet itself. However, that doesn't mean we can't detect continents and oceans. The planet is going to be rotating uh, around its axis. And, and, and if we can track the flux of the planet, the color as a function of time, we actually can do some uh, inference of, of uh, of the surface of the planet, we can, uh, for example, if we look at Earth, uh, we would see a modulation of color uh, when we're when when we're looking at a Pacific Ocean uh, uh, facing our, our, our telescope, mostly blue. Uh, when it's uh, when it's the, the Amazon, there's more green, etc. So we're actually hoping to make these measurements of uh, continents and oceans on uh, on exoplanets uh, with you know, in the sort somewhat short term with conventional large telescopes, um, the resolved image is going to take much, much longer. Well, fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to hold you to your willingness to uh, to give another talk with a little, little more of the technical detail. And maybe we talk about these ideas, too. So we really appreciate your spending the time with us. I thought it was a marvelous presentation. And uh, I know everybody joins me in thanking you again so thank you before everyone goes we have a few important notes the next meeting number 2447 will be in two weeks on friday october 22 the speaker will be feng chuan lu project director of the 30 meter telescope project naturally he'll be speaking on the tmt and will also illustrate the use of adaptive optics in this project his lecture will nicely complement tonight's lecture. The 2448th meeting will be on Friday, November 5th. The speaker will be Rami Amaro. Rami holds an endowed professorship in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. She will be speaking on virus dynamics, including how SARS-CoV-2 binds and enters cells. The 2449th meeting will be on Friday, November 19th. The speaker will be Robert Beyer, Kenyan Professor of Applied Physics and Photon Science at Stanford University. He will be speaking about laser-driven particle accelerators on a chip. The 2450th meeting will be on Friday, December 3rd. This meeting will coincide with PSO's DuPont Summit, to which all PSW members are invited without charge. The speaker will be Francisco Cordova, Director of the Arecibo Observatory, and he will be speaking about the observatory's history and its prospects for the future. And the 2,451st meeting will close the fall lecture series on Friday, December 17th. The speaker will be Sean Andrews, astrophysicist at the Hart Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He will be speaking on the current understandings of how planets are formed, both in our solar system and around other stars. Before we go, please join me in thanking tonight's crew, James, Robin, and Ann, for producing tonight's event. Thank you very much for your hard work. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. I adjourn the 2446 meeting of the society. I wish everyone a really good evening or morning, depending on where you are. Meeting is adjourned.